Oh, hi there. So in this video, we're going to begin our first of three lectures on supply and demand, which is really exciting. The perfect competition model, which is what supply and demand is, is one of the most important models in all of economics. So let's get started. So like I said a moment ago, the perfect competition model is sometimes actually called supply and demand and vice versa, although we're going to use supply and demand in different ways for the rest of the course. What we're really modeling with this most basic model is a market where you have huge numbers of buyers and sellers, so many that none of them could affect the price, and all of the products that we're going to be dealing with, at least initially, are exactly the same. So there's no advertising. Nobody's trying to like kind of um, make, a, make an argument that their product is better or that the other product is worse, the competitor or something like that. Um, this kind of simplifies out a lot of all of the other things that, that might actually create some differences. We're going to explore those differences later, right? But for right now, suffice it to say that um, this is a market where there's thousands and thousands of buyers and sellers, and they're all exactly the same product that they're transacting, okay? Now, what we're going to look at in this video first is demand. Then in the next video, we'll take a look at supply, and then we're going to put them together. So two terms related to demand. One is, is quantity demanded, and one is demand itself. And this requires a really Really important distinction in your mind. The quantity demanded is the amount that people are willing and able, and I'm going to write this definition out kind of word for word, willing and able to buy at a specific, or you could say like a certain price. So for example, if price is say 20, then we would say quantity demanded is, let's say, five units, right? Five units of product. So it's basically saying like the amount, the exact amount that everybody in the whole market is willing to buy if the price were blah. If the price were blah, 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 then they would buy this much stuff, right? So you're going to have a different amount depending on what people are, or depending on what the price is, right? As the price rises, what we'll find is that people are willing and able to buy less of that quantity demanded. Now, that's actually the law of demand. Demand, though, is a relationship. And this is where students often get really kind of tripped up. Demand is the relationship, and it, and it really is a math function, relationship between all prices and their respective QDs. So what, what it really represents is that like if you were to take all of the different links, like think of a number pair, quantity demanded and price, and then a different price and a different quantity demanded, and a different price and a different quantity demanded, and you could list them all out, you could even put them in a table, that table reflects demand. So as a way to think about it, I'm going to do that little table right here. Imagine that if the price were um, let's say $10. Well, maybe people don't want to buy any units. So the quantity demanded at $10 is zero. But if we lower the price to nine, maybe people are willing and able to buy one. So the quantity demanded at price nine is one. If we lower the price to eight, maybe people are willing and able to buy two. The quantity demanded at price eight is two and so forth. But if we were to describe demand, you could actually take these number pairs, plug them into a function and construct it or plug them into an algorithm and construct a function, right? It's literally like plotting a line. And that's where we get a demand curve from. So we, we kind of sketch a little demand curve off to the right. And what we're always going to do is put price up here and quantity down here. So quantity is going to be on the x-axis, price will be on the y-axis. So P and Q. And then demand is always going to be downward sloping. Um, now, sometimes we're going to break that rule and say that demand might look a little bit different. But for the most part, in our initial picture here, we're going to draw is just demand is downward sloping. Demand goes down to the dirt. It doesn't go back upwards, right? So there are some kind of things we're going to play with it. But for right now, it's downward sloping. And this is a demand curve, what we've labeled here. Now, note that if we were to say lower the price, notice if we were to go from like, let's say, price 10 to say price 7. Well, we might end up buying more units, right? We would expect there to be a greater quantity demanded. And so that's actually the law of demand, is that there's a relationship between price and quantity demanded. Many times, people will misstate the law of demand and say, when price changes, that demand changes. But that is absolutely incorrect. Absolutely wrong. Like, totally wrong. Don't do that. Price 
is not going to change demand. Price doesn't change demand. Price doesn't shift this demand curve. All that happens when we're changing price is we're going to go to a different point. It would be like saying, okay, we were here in this number pair. Now price changed. Price went to seven. We just went to a different pair of numbers. So we're going to write the law of demand as saying as price increases, therefore quantity demanded decreases. And we can say as price decreases, therefore quantity demanded increases. And here's a good point to mention that these three little dots mean therefore. It's a really common convention in math and business and economics. As price increases, therefore quantity demand decreases and so forth, right? That there is an inverse relationship between these two things is another way that we describe it. Now, there are things that actually make this curve move, right? So if we were to say, what might make the curve shift to the right or increase? A way to think about that would be that if we were saying that the demand curve shifted, that no matter what the price is, whether the price was 10 or 9 or 8 or 7, people are willing and able to now buy more units than they used to be able to buy. Like on the quantity axis, we shifted to the right. People are able to buy more units or willing and able to buy more even if the price stays the same. Right. And so this is saying that the number pairs themselves are changing. Now at price 10, people are willing and able to buy twice as many. At price seven, people are willing and able to buy twice as many. And so this is a fundamental kind of shift in the relationship between price and quantity demanded. Now in this new demand curve, we could say, you know, well, if price goes down, we just change to a different point on this demand curve. So as we go to talk through the five things that are going to shift to demand, um, first is to know an increase is always going to be to the right. A decrease in demand will always be to the left. And that's going to be true for the rest of the class, right? An increase is to the right, a decrease is to the left. Now, five things shift demand and only five things, but price does not. And in class, we're going to talk about how price doesn't shift the curve. So that, that's an important thing to tuck in the back of your mind. You're going to see that question a lot. It'll say the price goes up. What happens to demand? And you say it doesn't change. Demand doesn't change. Only quantity demanded does. Those are very different things. Now, merit is going to shift to demand. And I'm going to go through all five of these. Um, they're useful to do more practice with, though, so that you can get your head around examples, right? Market size. If the market number of buyers, if the market size increases, well, then there's going to be twice as many people willing to buy at every single price, right? It doesn't matter if the price was 10 or 7. There's twice as many people. So we would say that demand increases. Now, for all of these, the opposite opposite is also true. If there are half the number of buyers, then there's half the demand. So the market size. Expectations about future prices. This is one that's helpful to think just through in your own mind. If you as a consumer are expecting that prices are going to go up soon, what are you going to do today? Well, you're going to buy it right now, at least if you can, right? If it's a good that doesn't expire, you're going to buy it because you want to avoid that higher price. So expectations of higher future prices will cause demand to rise today. But if people believe that prices will fall soon, then demand will fall today. A good example of that, if you're like, how would people think that prices are going to fall? Well, there's a lot of times where you kind of know that a product is going to go on sale. So shocker, October, very few, very few people buy flat screen TVs. Why? Well, Everybody knows, or at least a lot of people know, that on Black Friday in the United States, lots and lots of flat screen TVs go on sale. So a lot of people will wait at the end of October, beginning of November to buy TVs. Demand falls in the expectation that there's going to be a sale on televisions on Black Friday. That kind of stuff happens all the time. Like if consumers start to hear news reports that maybe prices are rising for a particular product, oftentimes they'll run out to the store and buy it because they want to avoid paying that higher price. Related goods. There are two types of goods where the price change of the other good could affect the demand for your good. So earlier I mentioned price doesn't shift the curve. That's with the actual good in question. So for example, the price of apples does not change the demand for apples, but a related goods price could change the demand for apples. So for example, the two types of related goods are complements and substitutes. Complement goods just complement each other. They work together. Not complement like that's a nice shirt, but more they work together. So a complement good would be like a hot dog and a hot dog bun, right? That's the classic example. If you're buying a hot dog, 99 times out of 100, you're buying a hot dog bun. If you're buying a hot dog bun, 99 times out of 100, you need something to go in it, you're probably buying hot dogs or sausages or whatever. So. If the complement good goes up in price, then people are going to think to themselves at the store, oh, geez, it's kind of expensive for the hot dog buns. I'm going to buy fewer hot dogs. So the price goes up for complement good. We would expect, whoops, demand to go down for your product, right? An example, again, hot dogs and buns. 
what I'd encourage you to do is go to the grocery store. Next time you're at the grocery store and look on the end caps of the aisles, they often put complement goods together. Uh, one that's really, really common that students always mention, marshmallows, chocolate, and graham crackers, right? Like, you know complement goods inside your head. It just takes a minute to think about what those might look like. And again, if you're struggling with this idea of how would that relationship operate, think through, slow down, right? And I know that's scary, slow your thinking. But if the buns go up in price, ah, they're more expensive, I'm not going to buy as many hot dogs. So the demand for hot dogs will go down. Now, substitute goods are a little different. Those are goods that obviously substitute. They're bought instead of each other. So a classic example here might be Coke and Pepsi, right? Now, Coke and Pepsi are essentially substitutes, right? A lot of people go, ah, I'll never have that or whatever. But if the price of, let's say, Pepsi doubles, well, people are going to say, oh, geez, Pepsi's really expensive. I want to buy Coca-Cola. And so people will shift their purchases away from the higher price Pepsi, and the demand for Coca-Cola will rise, right? So you got to think about kind of like the substitute good having an effect on the demand for that original good. Um, another way to think about this would be that if the substitute good is falling in price, right, maybe it's going on sale, people are going to quantity demand more of that and they're demanding less of the original good that we were talking about. Again, it's useful to me to stick an example in your head and be able to refer back to it over and over again. The last two shifters of demand are income and tastes. Income has two little categories too. Normally, income is pretty straightforward for what we call a normal good. The vast majority of goods operate like this. You know, uh, T-shirts, CDs, nobody buys CDs. Uh, hot dogs, Coke, Pepsi, right? All that kind of stuff. That kind of thing is normal. In that case, as people's income rises, the higher income that they earn allows them to have more willing and ability to buy. And so we would expect demand to rise. So typically when people's income rises, they buy more of this thing and so demand increases. But there is a special type of good where that doesn't happen, where as people's income rise, they actually buy less of the thing. There's quantity demanded at every single price, there's less. And so we would say there's less demand. That's the kind of good that we call inferior. An inferior good is not bad in and of itself or low quality. It actually just describes that relationship where as your income rises, you buy less. Oftentimes the example is instant ramen. Like people can usually understand that one. Instant ramen. Um, sometimes people say spam or canned meat, right? Any kind of tinned meats are usually an example of that. And, and you might think like, well, those sound low quality. It doesn't necessarily mean that it's low quality. It really just is describing this relationship where as people's income rises, they buy way less instant ramen, right? The last one would be taste and preferences. This one's kind of obvious and it's really just saying the market size is changing, but sometimes it's easier to think about it as tastes. If consumers start to prefer your good more for some reason, maybe the Surgeon General says your good cures cancer, people are going to run out and buy it and so demand will increase. As a quick review, we're going to increase, decrease, increases to the right, decreases to the left. And then of course, the most important thing to understand here is the difference between quantity demanded and demand. One last way to think about that is that demand is like the math function itself. It's like, you know, y equals f of x. And the quantity demanded is actually just the x value. And the y value is equal to the price, right? So you can, if that helps you, quantity demanded equals the x and y equals the price, y equals f of x. That's really a kind of way to think about this. All right. Hopefully this helped you. I'll see you next time.